Good morning and welcome to Mass Memorial CME Sunday School for August 2nd, 2020. We're still in our summer quarter. We are now on Unit 3, Faith and Wisdom in James. Our lesson is called Faith and Wisdom. Our key verse for today is, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. James chapter one, verse five, and that's the King James Version. Our lesson scripture comes from James, the first chapter, verses one through 11. Our goals for today are to consider the relationship between wisdom and perseverance through trials, to affirm the value of trials and hardships in making us more wise and productive disciples, and to pray for godly wisdom by which to endure life's trials and temptations. Our lesson scripture reads as thus. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. But let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower fails, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. The word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. Let's look at our background. So now we're starting in a new book. We're starting in the book of James. We were in the gospels and before that we were in Proverbs. And so first we just need to talk about James as the author. So James was one of Jesus' four half brothers and you can find that in Mark the sixth chapter verse three. His parents from natural conception were Mary and um, we consider Joseph as his earthly father or as his father. Um, even though it's not mentioned. Um, he did not believe at first that Jesus was the Messiah. So if you can read about that in John 7, 1 through 5, it says his brothers didn't believe him. It's said to be, he was said to become a strong believer after meeting the resurrected Jesus. And we see that scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. And then he also, after becoming a strong believer, he became a leader of the church in Jerusalem. And you can see that in Acts 15, 13 through 21. The epistle of James, um, again, the letter is probably written by Jesus' half-brother James. There's more than one person whose name is James in the Bible. So there's at least five of them named James in the Bible that we know of. And just like with us, there we have names that might be common in our families, We might, names that are common amongst our friends. And so, um, it's just that there was five people who had the name James. So they do consider that this letter was written by Jesus' half-brother. Um, this letter is very straightforward. It's not even set up really like a letter. It's almost like um, little mini sermons or practical points, similar to Proverbs in just um, points of wisdom. And in the epistle, and the word epistle just means letter, in the epistle of James, it emphasizes practical application of the gospel to the believer's daily life. So he just straightforward. It says in the Word and Life Study Bible, it says, for James, religion is not about church membership, financial contributions, or even teaching Sunday school. The acid test of true religion is doing the truth, not just hearing it or speaking it. Action is the hallmark of authentic faith. In this respect, James mirrors Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He forcefully condemns counterfeit religion that substitutes theory for practice. And so that's from the Word and Life Study Bible. With that in mind, the idea is a lot of times 
we don't say that Christianity is a religion. We say it's a relationship. It's a relation, but it is a religion, but it's the true religion. And true religion, um, you know, I would say action speaks louder than words. So we have to know the words, but we also have to show it with our actions. And so with this in mind, um, we're talking about true religion today as far as how James sees things. Now in the original key verse that we read um, at the very beginning, that was the King James Version. And James chapter one, verse five said, verse five said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, they give it to all men liberally. So that means he freely gives it, it's plentiful and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. And I wanted to go ahead and give you a definition for the word upbraid. So upbraid means to find fault with someone, to scold, to reproach, to chastise, to reprimand, to admonish, to chide, to rebuke, to reprove, to berate. And so when I printed out the scripture for you, I used the New King James Version for our actual reading. But just so you would know, the word upbraid means those things. So in other words, um, when we get to that verse, God's not going to scold us, um, reproach us, chastise us, reprimand us, admonish us, rebuke us if we ask for wisdom. So he's not going to find fault with us if we ask for wisdom. So that's what it says, upbraided not. So I wanted to make sure you all understood that King James Version word. Let's get into our lesson study. And so at the very beginning of James, we're just going to talk about the intro or the greeting. And it says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So first it starts off with the word bond servant. And so what is a bond servant? And so I have this from godquestions.org. And it says, a bond servant is a slave. And some Bibles, the word bond, save, bond servant is the translation of the Greek word doulos, which means one who is subservient to and entirely at the disposal of his master, a slave. Other translations use the word slave or servant. In Romans times, the term bond servant or slave could refer to someone who voluntarily served others. Okay, jumping to the next highlighted part. The Hebrew word for bond servant, ebed, had a similar connotation. However, the Mosaic law allowed an indentured servant to become a bond servant voluntarily. If the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door of the doorpost and pierce his ear with an arl. Then he will be his servant for life. And that's from Exodus 21, five to six. So we see people now, not just with an earring, but what is basically a all, a AWL all in their ear. And now that doesn't mean that they're saying that they're a bond servant for Jesus Christ, but I actually did meet a Christian minister once who had pierced his ear um, um, with, well, that's like the bigger earring for the young people who are seeing it that makes it like, looks like they've got a, I don't know how you describe it, big, large hole in their ear um, with an earring in it. And so I actually did know a, a Christian minister who worked on campus who had did that, um, and his was as a sign of being a bond servant that he chose to serve Christ forever. And that was just his way of doing that. So you don't have to physically do that. Going on with this exp explanation of bond servant, now down to the next part that's highlighted, it says, throughout the New Testament, the word bond servant, slave, or servant is applied metaphorically to someone absolutely devoted to Jesus. So with that in mind, if we use that definition, James is saying a bond servant of Jesus Christ, that he is absolutely devoted to Jesus. Remember, he's Jesus' half-brother, but at the, the beginning, he didn't believe that Jesus was the Savior of the world. He didn't believe he was Messiah. Then he came to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so now he's saying, I, am, I believe in Jesus so much that I am absolutely devoted to Jesus. And so then going on in verse one, James says, he says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Well, that's scattered abroad. That's a word that um, we talk about in terms of Jewish people and actually in terms of African people also. And that word spelling it is D-I-A-S-P-O-R-A. 
Um, that's the spelling of the word. And the pronunciation of the word is diaspora. Okay, so diaspora. And so basically it means the Jews who were scattered abroad and living outside of Israel. And they were scattered due to, all the way back, if we look in the Old Testament, the Syrian invasion of Israel and the Babylonian exile from Judah. So that goes all the way back right after um, King Solomon when the kingdom split. And we talked about that way back in our Sunday school lessons. Um, so just that idea that the Jews were scattered and they were scattered and some of them did go back to um, to the to Jerusalem after things were built back up, but some of them stayed in these other areas. And sometimes, you know, they still weren't considered a part of those areas. They were still considered foreigners. They were considered outsiders. Sometimes they weren't treated well. And we can look at it, look at that in terms of African American people that um, were scattered, were no longer in Africa, um, or and where we're in the land that even, we were even brought to, but people still don't. Um, they consider us outsiders, they consider us foreigners, um, they don't treat us well, and we see that. And so these people are scattered and they're going through. And so then James is sending this letter to this set of people, and then he says greetings. And the word greetings here is more than just saying hi or hello. It actually means rejoice, be glad, because that's what we're talking about today. Even though the people are going through, James is saying rejoice, be glad. Now we're going to go to James chapter one, verses two through four. And it says, um, there's a verse, Psalm 34, 19, that says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And so this is one of those verses that we read that everyone goes, hmm. And the verse says, verse two says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse or various temptations or trials, count it all joy. And so with that in mind, this is how it goes from verses two through four. They're saying, when you have trials, trials, you see I have an arrow, leads to the testing of your faith. And the testing of your faith will lead you to, lead, hopefully lead you to patience. And so, um, and that means you're waiting on God and you're trusting God. And when you complete that waiting on God and trusting God, that will lead you to being perfect and complete. So that's the series that we're supposed to go through. And so I know a lot of people want to say pray for patience, but you don't need to pray for patience because if you pray for patience, that means you're going to have trials. And we already have trials. And even that verse says, um, count it all joy when you fall. And so that means sometimes it's not about you wanting them. It's about you falling. Like if you're falling, that's not a plan when you fall. Um, I know there's some people who skydive and that's their plan. But most of the time when you fall or you trip, it's something that you weren't expecting. So it says when you fall into various, and they're different, they don't even ever look the same, um, various trials. So trials, um, as we grow up in Christ, that's going to test our faith. And then that's going to lead to us patience, lead it to us patiently waiting on God. So trusting him and believing that for deliverance. And then after that, that's going to help us be perfect and complete. From the Jeremiah Study Bible, it says, to count it all joy means to appraise one's situation intelligently, confident of the good that God can do through it. We know it says, I'm going to stop for a minute. We know it says in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So it doesn't say all things are good. It said all things work together for good. So going on with this um, writing it says the trials that god allows strengthens the believer and are different from the consequences of sin in a believer's life patience does not require us to resign ourselves to whatever happens but to have a tough resolve or brave endurance in adverse circumstances trials produce durability as well as maturity perfect means to be fully and completely developed or mature Complete refers to being whole. Without trials, Christians cannot develop to maturity, so we can't grow up, or wholeness. And that is from the Jeremiah Study Bible. And also at this time, I just want to mention there's a difference between joy and happiness. 
happiness depends on what's happening. So a lot of times we'll say, um, oh, something's going great, so we're happy. Um, but then Joy is saying, even when things are not going great, we still can hold on to the Lord and we can still trust him and we can still rejoice in him. And so even though we sing songs and we all want to be happy because there's a song children used to sing um, in, at church, if you're happy and you know it, say amen. We used to sing that one or um, happiness is to know the savior. And so we wanna be happy. Um, and it is happiness to know the savior. And we should say amen when we're happy, so be it. We should be happy with those songs. Um, and then, um, but it's also the idea that we wanna go beyond happy. We wanna go to the point that even when things are not going well and we look at what's going on right now um, with um, COVID-19 and other things that are happening in this world, and it might not make you happy, but we should have joy. Um, we, you, you don't want to lose your joy. There's a um, song, a, old, a Southern song um, that they sing in Florida that says, I still have joy. I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, I still have joy. And so that's what we want. Going on with this idea or with this, uh, so we have a lot of scripture in lesson today. I want us to look at 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 19. And I've just highlighted um, verse 12 and part of 13. Because sometimes we say, why is this happening to me? Because as Christians, some people feel like nothing bad is supposed to happen to us or nothing negative is going to happen. But we live in a fallen world. And again, we can fall into things because we live in a fallen world. And even though God allows it, um, he's still with us in the journey. So it says in Isaiah, even though we walk through the water or even if we walk through the flood or even if we go through the fire, we won't be burned. God is our savior. He's our redeemer. He goes with us through it. So we don't stay in it, but we do go through it. But it says in 1 Peter 4, 12, um, it says, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, it goes that joy, to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. And so we know that our Savior and Lord suffered. And so then um, we, we suffer also. There's times we'll suffer also. So we shouldn't think it's strange. Bad things, unfortunately, do happen to what we call good people. Or we can say trials do happen to Christian people. Moving on, still on that idea. There's a song that we sing, and I just gave you um, some of the lyrics. Um, and the name of the song is Trading My Sorrows. And it goes, I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. And then it goes on from there. And so I'm using this song is because when you trade an item in, you don't get it back. And so when I, um, bought a new car. I'm still buying. When I bought a new car last year or a different car last year, I traded in my old car. And so the Kia Sportage is, was gone to the dealership and I didn't get it back. It's gone because I traded it in. And so I like this song for what we're talking about is because even though we're going through trials, um, we've got to trade our sorrow. And we've got to trade our sickness and we have to trade our pain for the joy of the Lord. Let's look at some verses concerning that. So trading my sorrow, it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So Jesus, and that he is Jesus. That's Isaiah 53, four to first part A. Surely Jesus has borne our griefs and he's carried our sorrows. So he, he's taking them so we can have the joy of the Lord. Then it says in Nehemiah 8, 10, the second part, do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that's one reason why we have to have joy. Because if we go with happiness and then we're not happy, then we can get depressed, we can get down, and we can get defeated, and it will make us weak. And so we have to trade away that sorrow 
And we have to hold on to the joy of the Lord because the joy of the Lord is our strength. It says in Psalm 30, verse 5, the second part, weeping may endure for a night. So that doesn't mean we're not going to cry, but joy comes in the morning. And that doesn't mean that it's just going to be um, when it's early in the morning that we're going to have joy, but we're going to go through something which seems like a night season or a midnight in our lives. But joy is going to come for God's people. So joy comes in the morning. Then it also says, you have turned my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me in gladness. They used to put on sackcloth, which was basically like a burlap bag. Um, and um, they would rip their clothes and they would weep when they were really sad. And so this verse is saying that, and even in mourning, um, mourning is the opposite of dancing. When we're dancing, we're normally, we're, I, I'm gonna say you're happy. We're happy or we're having a good time or we're joyous. And so he says, we're going to get rid of that mourning and have dancing. We're going to take off that sorrow, that sadness that that sackcloth shows. And we're going to end up putting on clothing of gladness. And that's Psalm 30, verse 11. Then we also need to trade our shame because even in falling into trials um, and when something happens to us, then we, that we should not do, or we do something we should not do, we end up with shame. And Satan wants us to be ashamed because he doesn't want us to declare the word of the Lord. Um, and so he'll make us feel unqualified to do that or that we shouldn't because of things that we have done. But it says in, the, in Isaiah 6, um, the first part 7a and the last part 7c, instead of your shame, you shall have double honor and then everlasting joy shall be theirs. And then in Psalm 3, 3, it says, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. And then even a trial might be a sickness. We know people who are sick, um, family members who are sick, friends who are sick right now with dealing with um, the coronavirus and, not, and everything else that's going on. There's still heart disease, there's still diabetes, there's still high blood pressure, there's still cancer, um, even a cold, even the flu, um, but different sicknesses, um, fibromyalgia, lupus, all that sickness, um, we wanna trade our sickness to. And because we know that it says in Isaiah 53, 5b, that by Jesus' stripes, we are healed. So again, the song, using the song, we're trading our sorrow, we're trading our shame for the joy of the Lord. We're trading our sickness. And then the last part is we're trading our pain for the joy of the Lord. It says in Revelation 21, 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. So even with the idea that we're laying it down for the joy of the Lord, it says in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So again, we have to trade our sorrow. We have to trade our shame. We have to lay it down for the joy of the Lord. We have to trade our sickness. We have to trade our pain. We have to lay it down for the joy of the Lord. So as we go through various trials, we need to count it all joy because that, again, going back, the trials are testing our faith. The testing of our faith brings about patience. And that patience that we have as we trust God and as we endure, that leads us to being perfect and complete in him. Now, our next part of our lesson was James 1 five through eight. And in James one, five through eight, it says that goes, our key verse was verse five. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So we talked about what upbraideth meant. So in other words, we have to, if we need wisdom, we need to ask God. And so Matthew seven, verses seven through eight, says basically keep asking, seeking, and knocking. It says ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will op be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks, it will be open. So God has wisdom for us. We need to ask for it in a situation where we need it. And so we need to ask and believe that he's going to um, give it to us. And one of the things that the Lord's been laying on my heart lately is a lot of times we believe in God, but do we believe God? 
So we know God is God, but do we believe God? Do we believe he'll do things for us? Do we believe he'll give us this wisdom that we ask for? So it's not enough just to just believe in God that he exists, but to believe that he is a reward of those that diligently seek him. And so we need to ask for wisdom. And then it goes on and says, now don't go and um, basically be double-minded about it. In other words, um, don't doubt. It says in verse six, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Verse seven, but let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Verse eight. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So using the Message Bible, it says, this is how the Message Bible says it. It says, people who worry their prayers, and I love that line, people who worry their prayers are like wind-whipped waves. Or even like you can think of a buoy or a boat on, uh, we say, like a ship that's tossed and driven. <laughs> um, don't think you're going to get anything from the master that way, adrift at sea keeping all your options open. We must, everyone, believe God. Ask for wisdom, listen to receive that wisdom, and then be obedient and do what God says. And so we don't want to worry our prayers. We don't want to go and pray and then just start worrying because that means we're not trusting. And I know that's something that I'm still working on, not to worry my prayers. Um, to believe that God is God. And even in some of the things that I'm studying lately, just for myself, I'm reading a book by um, a Christian author, Beth Moore. And she says um, some things that we need to remember. And one thing is that, well, one of the things is we have to believe that God is who he says he is. We have to believe that God can do what he says he can do. We have to believe that that we are who God says we are. We have to believe that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And the fifth thing that she says is we have to remember that the word of God is um, active, is living, and is working in our lives. So we have to believe God, everyone. So we don't want to worry our prayers. We want to keep asking, seeking, knocking. We don't want to be double-minded. And that word means just that. Um, well, should I do this or that, this or that, going back and forth, not making the decision, um, um, not believing God, not trusting. And then even the way this message Bible says, keeping all your options open, people start messing with stuff that's ungodly. They ask, they might ask the wrong counselors, the wrong advisors. They might go and talk to a psychic. Okay, you're not trusting God. We Don't worry your prayers, pray and believe and hold on to what God says. We sing that hold on to God's unchanging hand. Then in James 1, 9 through 11, that part all of a sudden starts talking about rich and poor. And it says, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. You'd be like, huh? But he's of low degree. Then it says, but the rich in him that, in that he is made low. You'd be like, wait a minute, but he's rich. So why is he low? Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. But the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. So all of a sudden we started, James is talking about rich and poor. And this reminded me of a couple of songs. And so there's a song we sing that says, give thanks. And um, in the middle of that song, they have it highlighted. It says, um, and now let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done. For us. So um, you've heard us sing this song. Um, and so the idea is, yes, they don't have physical money, um, but they are rich because they're, they're saved. They have God. And so they are happy that they are rich in the word of God. They're rich in the Lord. And so even though they might be poor by um, they're, they're rich in wisdom. They might be poor by financial, but they're rich in wisdom. Another song going, I'm going to go into the Billie Holiday world. Um, God bless the child. Some of them say, God bless this child. But um, when I was preparing this lesson, the line that I have highlighted came to mind where it says, money, you've got lots of friends crowding round the door. When you're gone and spending ends, 
they don't come no more, you know? And so it's just that idea that um, rich people can't get stuck on their money. You can't get stuck on prosperity. Prosperity comes and goes. And so again, when you got a lot of money, you got a lot of people who are supposedly your friends, they all around your door, you got stuff to give out. I even remember in college, if you had a care package, um, everybody would be there trying to see what's in your care package, trying to share your care package. When your care package is gone, some of them are gone. You know, when you got um, money, we see that when people win the lottery or even um, they come across a lot of money um, or inheritance or something, all of a sudden everybody's their friend, everybody um, wants to be around them. Or if they, you're just spending, people want to be around you and be part of the, be part of your crowd or be part of your um, crew. And then all of a sudden um, your money runs out and um, your money runs out and you're stuck. I know even a student at Michigan State once, he had a car and this happens to people. He had a car and him and his fraternity brothers were going to Florida and, and they all were like, yeah, yeah, we're getting in his car. And they all got in his car and they went down to Florida. And this is, you know, and then they got to, they got to Florida. They had a good time. And then his car died in Florida. Well, his, his, those local brothers, not all his brothers, not all his fraternity brothers, but those local, um, the ones that are from up here, <laughs> they left him. They left him down there. But um, praise God that his other fraternity brothers down in Florida helped him to get back and helped him to get everything set with his car. But it's just, it's sort of like that idea of, hey, when the car was running, everybody want to be your friend. Everybody wants to be there around you. So, because um, they're not really your friends um, like that. But just that idea that don't depend on your money because money comes and goes. Um, and um, money, we also say the expression, money can't buy you happiness, you know. So it's that idea that when we're looking at these scriptures about um, prosperity, it's the idea that um, even if you don't have a lot, rejoice that you have your salvation. That's the richest thing you can have. You have Jesus. Now that we've got King Jesus, remember, um, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So we're rich because we're God's children. And so if you're looking at, um, and we, we're rich because we, we can ask God for wisdom and he'll just give it to us. And he gives it liberally. So it's just like this um, large banquet table with everything we want. You know, wisdom is on this table. Um, or, and that's one of the things we should want. You know, and wisdom is on this table and he says, like, have all you want. Oh, yeah, you want seconds or oh, you want thirds? Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, and so the idea is don't get stuck on, on money. We even know we look at the economy. Uh, money loses its value. Um, uh, or even these days, we, we uh, my sister and I were talking about supply and demand because um, a bottle of Lysol spray um, the other day cost me six dollars and seventy nine cent plus tax. And so you know, did I buy it? Yes, because the supply is low and the demand is high. But it's just the idea that money um, can lose its value or uh, money doesn't buy everything you want or money won't even spread as far as you want. So we need to look at wisdom from God. Look at wisdom from God. Going on with this idea, it says um, in Isaiah 48, the grass withers, just like they were talking about in that scripture, scripture. The flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. So even they said the rich man, um, he's going to fade like a flower. Well, and we can look at that in terms of right now. Um, we have different types of flowers. We have annuals. We have perennials. But um, annuals, we just don't, they, they're they there for the year. And at the end, the sun beams out, um, burns up, they burn up, they die. They don't get enough water, but they'll die anyway. Um, they, they come up that once. Then you have perennials and they might come back the next year, but they still fade out. Like right now um, in front of my apartment, I have yellow daylilies. Well, they were beautiful. And my, na and my, um, my neighbor has yellow daylilies that the complex um, planted in front of her, beautiful. But right now they're not looking too great. The flower, those, some of those flowers have already faded. You know, like they might, but because they're perennials, they'll come back. But it's the idea that, um, Flowers do fade. Grass does wither up. Um, I was in Florida and it was hot. You know, my sister lives, one of my sisters lives um, in Oklahoma and it's extremely hot, you know, and grass withers. You know, grass is not green necessarily. <laughs> it might be 
well, I don't know, tan. So because it's going to wither and the flower fades. But we need to know that the word of our God stands forever. And so when we have Jesus Christ, we have that word of God. And we can hold on to that word. And that word makes us rich. So let's remember that we are rich, not because of finances, but because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. From our discovery lesson on page 44, it says, from the standpoint of Jewish wisdom literature, experiencing the good and the bad of life are occasions when people learn more about God and self. James articulates this viewpoint when he says that says trials are testing of faith, an exercise that strengthens faith over time, like a muscle. Talking about this for a few minutes, that line where it says people learn more about God and self when they go through um, good and bad experiences in life. And a lot of um, people were saying at the beginning of um, 2020, because it's the number 20, because the year is 2020, they're like, oh, this is going to be the year of spiritual insight or spiritual sight, because we always talk about 2020 vision is perfect vision. And so everybody was excited. Oh, we're going to have spiritual vision in the year 2020. Well, we have. It just has not looked like we thought. We see a lot of behavior because of the good that has happened and the bad. We see people thinking about good. We, we see people being more thankful about teachers right now because they had to teach their own children and now, or have their own children at home and they are very thankful for teachers. We're thankful for those research researchers, medical researchers. We're thankful for our doctors. Um, physicians. We're thankful for our nurses and our physicians assistants and all those who are working, as we say, on the front lines. Very thankful. That's the good. And then even with the bad, um, we see um, people and we, people learn about God and self. Um, we can have faith in God during this time. We can trust God during this time. Um, we can, again, seek the wisdom of God during this time. But a lot of people, unfortunately, we can see are being disobedient. They are being disruptive. They are being selfish. Um, they're being hateful. They're being mean. Uh, and all this is from the bad happening. Um, and we have to know that God is with us. There's a song that says that he's with us in the good and the bad. You know, and he loves us through and he loves us through our good and our bad. There's a song that says that he loves us through our good and our bad. And so, therefore, when we go through and we experience good and bad, we need to love him through the good and through the bad. Um, and we also still need to be Christ-like, um, act like a Christian. Um, and so our, we see people hoarding. Um, we see people um, unforgiving. Um, we see the stress levels going up because of the good and the bad of life. And so this is a time when we're going through some trials that are visible for the world. And so it's a testing of our faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and we're like who James is talking about because it says the scattered tribes. Because of COVID-19, we're scattered. We're not coming together at Mass Memorial CME Church. Um, or we're not coming together fellowshipping with other brothers and sisters in Christ in a group, um, we're scattered. Now, praise the Lord for our YouTube videos and for our Facebook and for um, all the ways that we can hear um, worship services and uh, our, our Zoom calls, our phone line calls, our conference calls, where we can be in touch with each other. But we're basically scattered. And so with that idea of being scattered and we're going through trials, we need to hold on again to God's unchanging hand. But again, these trials are testing our faith. Do we truly believe in God? Do we really believe that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord? And so then as it tests our faith, what happens is our faith will strengthen and it strengthens like a muscle. I want to read a devotion to you. It's long, so I did not really want to type it out. It comes out of the African-American devotional Bible. And it's by Reverend Dr. J. Alfred Smith, Sr. And he is a pastor emeritus from Allen Baptist Church 
in Oakland, California. And it is entitled, Count It All Joy. So please take this time just to listen to me for a minute. This is called Count It All Joy. You and I live in a world where suffering is like an unwanted guest. Somehow we are never able to prevent trials from bringing pain and sorrow into our lives. Suffering is a mystery. Bad things often happen to good people who are struggling to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Suffering never makes sense. Nevertheless, James made a very strong plea for Christians to rejoice in their suffering. J.B. Phillips, in his paraphrase of the Bible, restates the idea. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. How strange it seems to call suffering a friend when it gives us heartbreak and heartache. But James suggests that the purpose of suffering is to help, not to hurt. You and I are called to look past immediate hurt to see long range good. What is this long range good? It is the maturation of our faith. The muscles of faith are strengthened through tribulation. Just as many physical athletes suffer from fatigue and burnout, many spiritual athletes run out of spiritual energy during times of suffering. Developing the spiritual disciplines of meditation, prayer, and Bible study helps mature our spiritual muscles. In the midst of our increasing spiritual strength comes joy. There is joy in knowing that God has a loving purpose for our suffering and that no suffering lasts forever. There is joy in realizing that we do not bear our pain and suffering alone for God is with us in our struggles. There is joy in knowing that trials cannot separate us from God's care, but will bring us closer to him. Our Lord taught us to endure trials by the way he endured the last days of his earthly sojourn. Jesus lived victoriously. Jesus died majestically. Jesus arose from the grave triumphantly. This same Jesus promises you and me that we also can rejoice in the suffering if we don't resent it as an intruder, but rather welcome it as a friend. Again, this is a devotion found in the African American um, Devotional Bible. This devotion is by Reverend Dr. J. Alfred Smith Sr., who is pastor emeritus of the Allen Temple Baptist Church in Oakland, California. Count it all joy. So next, everyone, last week I gave you an exam and I'm not going to read the answers to you, but I did give you the answers so you can look through, see how you did on your exam. Pastor says he got 100%. He knows he has it. So I hope everybody else received an A++ as well. So you can look through the answers. I have them all in red for you on the, on the handout. So as you look through the lesson, and then finally, just to finish up our goals, consider the relationship between wisdom and perseverance through trials, affirm the value of trials and hardships in making us more wise and productive disciples, and pray for godly wisdom by which to endure life's trials and temptations. We, I do also want to take this time to um, thank God for our pastor being reassigned, um, uh, Reverend um, Adrian Swanigan and First Lady um, Sister Janine to Mass Memorial for this conference year. We thank God for you, and I pray that everyone have a blessed week. Um, much love. This is Sister Sharon. Bye bye.